on the heights for the director of music on my stringed instruments. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So if you think back to your teenage years and imagine the perfect weekend, take a minute to, to remember that, what that was like, I will share with you what mine was. For me, the perfect weekend were those years in which I could ride my bike by myself and be trusted to ride across town and go to the library. And if I got there early on Saturday, right after they, after they opened, I could go searching the stacks for a trilogy that I had not read yet a science fiction or fantasy trilogy. And if I could check it all out and bring it home, I could read the whole thing by the end of Sunday night if I stayed at it. And this, this was just perfect. I loved it. Right? And I would just lay down on the floor and start reading. And you know how they make uh, the carpet? There's some noxious chemicals in the carpet. Yeah, if you breathe them for about three hours, you start to get a headache. So I'd move to my bed and i just keep on reading there. So I just, this to me was perfect. And after doing this again and again and again, um, my mom once grounded me from reading as the only punishment she could come up with that I cared about. Uh, I, uh, so you get the sense of how trilogies work, right? Three books in a row, and we see them in movies too, so I'll use Star Wars as an example. Like, the first book, or the first movie always starts with, here are the characters, here's the world, here's the problem, and at the end of the first movie, there's sort of like a, you have some sort of conclusion. It doesn't fix everything, but you at least have some sort of happy note to end on. And then the second one, The Empire Strikes Back, that's when things get dark. That's when things get hard and ugly. That's when, well, The Empire Strikes Back. That's when the bad guys look like they're going to win. And you, you end the second, the second of three books or movies of a trilogy, usually ends on some sort of cliffhanger where Han Solo is in carbonite and Luke has been confronted with his father. You're not my father. It cuts off his hand and it's very bad. And then you get the third book. Our third movie, Return of the Jedi, and that's when everything comes to a big climactic conclusion. And so we have this sense of like pacing, you know what to expect. And this is how we're used to telling stories. You have a sense of, of pacing. You know that if you're watching Law and Order, you have one last commercial break before the last minute, five minutes of the show, and what's gonna happen at the beginning of that last five minutes? The jury comes back. Every time. That's how it always works, right? We, romantic comedies, how do they always unfold? They meet each other, they fall in love, they have the miscommunication, and then they get back together. So like half hour, 45 minutes into the romantic comedy, you're looking for the miscommunication, right? So we know how these stories unfold. And so I told my wife that, and I ruined romantic comedies for her forever, and, and I apologize, but that's how they work. We read Habakkuk, and he's in the middle of living the story of Israel. And if you had to identify where he is, he is between the Empire Strikes Back and the Return of the Jedi. And he's looking for some Return of the Jedi. That's where he's at. He's in the middle of some really hard times. And he, he's praying to God, can I get some Return of the Jedi now? Right? Can I get the third piece? Can this start to get better yet? That's not exactly how he puts it, but th this is the situation he's in. In 721, Assyria has invaded and destroyed the northern kingdom uh, of Israel, the ten tribes of Israel. And, and so the century of that, that was hard, right? And now in 609 BC, Assyria has fallen. And this is an inflection point. Things are going to be different now because Assyria is gone and there's this newcomer, Babylon, but we're not sure what's going to happen with them. We don't know if they're going to rise to power in the same way. And so how is this going to unfold? And so what we read is Habakkuk's cry to God. God, how long am I going to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell, help, murder, police, before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil, anarchy, violence? Law and order fall to pieces. Justice is a joke. The wicked have the righteous hamstrung and stand justice on its head. That's how the book starts, right? Why, is, why are things so messed up here? And God responds, look around at these godless nations around you and brace yourself. 
For something's about to take place, you're going to find hard to believe. I'm going to raise up the Babylonians to punish you. A dreadful and terrible people. They're out to kill. Death is on their minds. They will all eventually be blown away by the wind because they are brazen in the, their sin. They call strength their God. Which is not what Habakkuk is looking for. He's not looking for, it's about to get worse. Right? He, he wants a, a turn to the better. And so Habakkuk yells back at God. God, we're not going to die, are we? You, you chose the Babylonians? You can't be serious. You can't condone evil. Why don't you do something about this? Why are you silenced now? This is an outrage. Evil men swallow up the righteous and you stand around and watch? At this, there is no immediate response by God. And so this is the point of faith for Habakkuk because what he does, he says, I will stand at my watch post and I will listen. I will keep watch to see what God will say. And we don't know how long he watches. But he watches for a while. And then we move on and we read, The Lord answered me and said, Write down this vision. Make it plain on tablets so that a runner might read it. Now, to write something on a tablet and hand it off to runners was the fastest way to spread information. And so this is the equivalent of put it in email and send it to all your friends. Right? So be, be ready to tell everybody what I'm about to tell you. There is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end. It does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will come. It will not delay. And here's the vision. Look at the proud. This, their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous live by their faith. And that's pretty short. That's pretty, pretty direct, right? Look at the proud. They're not right. They will fall. The righteous, they will live. They will live by their faith. This is profoundly good news. This echoes back to Abraham. When, when Abraham was told, you're going to have a child, and then he starts cre creeping up on retirement age, and he's looking at God saying, really? Am I really going to have a child? And, and, and he believes. And he, the, the exact wor words out of Genesis are, he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Right? He, he lived by this, this is faith. He was credited to him as righteousness. This echoes this, this idea that the righteous will live by their faith. And in the end, it might be delayed. Abraham didn't have a kid for a while. It did work out. And so that's the news that Habakkuk is given, right? Make sure everyone knows, live by faith. The vision is coming. It does not, I'm not lying. It, it seems to tarry. Wait for it, right? And then God gives the other half of this. In the end, pride and arrogance is self-defeating, and, and God proclaims the fate of Babylon, which is what happens to Babylon in, in a while down the road. Woe unto Babylon, for people that live beyond their means, their creditors will catch up with them. Still true today, right? Woe unto Babylon, for you build households on evil deeds, you cut down people to get ahead. Woe unto Babylon for building a city based on violence. Woe unto Babylon for leading your neighbors astray. Woe unto Babylon for worshipping gods that are made of wood and stone and talking to them like they are, they are real. Habakkuk he hears this and he confesses that he does have faith, that God will act again. That God will act for the salvation of God's people, for the good of creation. And knowing that it could be a while before it comes to pass, this is how he ends the book. My bones turn to water, I stagger and stumble. He's looking down the road, it could be a bit, right? I sit back and wait for doomsday to de de descend on our attackers. Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I am singing jo joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my Savior. Counting on God's rule to prevail, I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm the king of the mountain. Now that's gutsy. Right? Though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. This is the statement of Habakkuk's faith. 
He doesn't know how things will turn out, but he's in it for the long haul. He's, he lives believing that he's going to get the sequel. He's, the Empire Strikes Back will end and he will get his Return of the Jedi, right? It's going to work out. Now, the thing about reading the story of Habakkuk is that he lives in an interesting time, 600 or so BC. And if you go 500 years before that, you had the trans at 1000, 11th century, you had the transition from the 12 tribes to the king of Israel, to King Saul. And if you read about that in 1st and 2nd Samuel, you'll know that was not exactly a smooth transition. And then you come up to Habakkuk at the 6th century, and, and things work out, but uh, first, Habakkuk's got to go through the, the fall of the destruction of the first temple, the exile for 70 years, the creation of the second temple, and then you have stability for 500 years. And then you get to the first century. In the first century, two very big things happen. Jesus and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And, after, and so everyone living through the first century, like they, they had lived in second temple Judaism, they were used to things going a certain way, and they enter this time period of the first century, and things kind of go crazy for a while. Things are kind of weird for them. Like, I'm a Jew, who's this Jesus guy? But Judaism's based on Jerusalem. But then the temple gets destroyed. And so Jews scatter across the known world in the first century. And they gotta figure out if they're gonna follow Jesus. It's a, it's a crazy century. About as crazy as it had been in Habakkuk's time. That's the first century. 500 years after that, five, in the sixth century, there's this dude named Pope, Pope Gregory the Great, who in the middle, anyone here remember when Rome falls? It's in the 400s, right? When Rome falls, you had a certain way of, of living. Like from the 1st century to the 5th century, the way things worked was you, you were living under the control of the Roman Empire with Roman roads and Roman legions and the Pax Romana. And there was a certain way things worked and you got used to it. And then you hit the 5th century and wah! Right? Things fall apart. The, the barbarians invade. You know where they get the word barbarians? Because all the, the, the Romans looked at the barbarians who were coming south, it was an insult because they thought they babbled. Right? That's where barbarians come from because it was an insult. The barbarite. So there's your random fact for the day. But the barbaroi invade and Rome falls and this Pope Gregory has to grapple with this moment of just crazy, a crazy century. And he creates the monastic orders that then make sure that we don't forget how to read. Right? We forgot a lot. This is a time period in which Britain forgets how a toilet works. And they won't, rem they won't figure it out again until the 1800s, right? But they, the, uh, Pope Gregory figures out, we are going to put together a new order. We're going to base a church on the monastic orders. And we're going to create this new thing called monasticism so we don't forget how to read. Then you get to 1,000, 500 years later. Things are going a certain way. Things are going a certain way. You get to the year 1,000. Do you have a sense that like Germany, Italy, France, Britain, Western Europe is fundamentally different than Eastern Europe, Russia, and all the Caucasus? Yep, this is when it happens. 1000 BC, it's called the Great Schism. It's when Western Europe looks at Eastern Europe and says, we're kicking you out of the church. And the Eastern says, we're kicking you out first, right? And then everything blows up for a while and they have to figure out, this is when the Roman Catholic Church begins as we would think of it, right? And so that's 1000 BC. Anyone want to remember what happens? What, what did I say? AD, 1000 AD, you get the trend, we're going in 500 year chunks, right? So, <laughs> King David, 1000 BC, Habakkuk, 500 BC, Jesus, 500 AD with Pope Gregory, 1000 AD with um, the Great Schism, and what happens in 1500 AD? The Reformation, right? In the Reformation, you had a certain way that life worked. The church crowned the kings, and that was how Europe was structured. There was a church, and the church was control of the kings, and the kings were, and so, 
and then Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to, and then starts this big old argument. And at the end of the 15th century, you don't have the Roman Catholic Church being the Catholic Church for all of Europe. At the end of the 16th century, you have splintered, and this sets the stage for humanism, enlightenment, separation of church and state. The world we know today began in the 16th century, when everything went crazy for a couple decades. Okay, so you see the pattern here, 1,500 first, 500, 1,000, 1,500. Huh, where are we today? We are living in a time of great upheaval. Does, does that everyone agree with that? Anyone think that everything's chill? Like, how much has culture and life changed since the 1960s? Greatly. We are in the middle of, Phyllis Tickle's a lady who figured out this trend. And, and like, this, this is an observation of how Western uh, Christ, or Christianity, the Abrahamic faiths, it's, as she puts it, every 500 years, the Abrahamic faiths have a garage sale. And they toss up all, a bunch of stuff they haven't used or they don't need, and they put things together in a new way. And it's not like in the middle of this transition that everything we know goes poof. Because the Catholic Church entered the 1500s, and they came out of the 1500s, but they were fundamentally different. They had shifted, they had changed, and then there were these new people playing around called the Protestants. And so we're in the middle of that, that time right now. I was talking to a friend of mine about this, uh, John Pinkston, and, and we were agreeing, man, wouldn't it have been nice to be a pastor about two generations ago? Like, can I just be honest and tell you that sometimes leading the church is really, really hard because I don't have a sense of where we're going. We're following Jesus best we can, but I got to tell you folks, I don't know the future, and it can be scary. And I read Habakkuk, and man, that resonates true, doesn't it? To read Habakkuk and to read him to say, to hear that the righteous will live by faith and that in the end it's going to work out, but right now my bones have turned to water and I'm kind of staggering. Wow, that, that, that's, whoo, that, that's true. Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten, the wheat fields are stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I take heart and gain strength. That seems to be about right. In the middle of this 500-year pattern, the best we can tell, we're not done yet. Like, it takes decades to get through one of these shifts. And I can't tell you when it's going to sort of settle down. But this is what I can tell you. Jesus is still Lord, Amen. God's still in charge, right. and on the other side of it, there is still going to be a place to gather and worship in his name, and we're heading towards his kingdom and the salvation of all that is. Amen. I can't tell you much else, but that's what I got for you. And speaking for myself, it's enough. Amen. I wouldn't mind some more, but that is enough. Amen. Amen.